Good morning once again, everyone. Thank you for being with us online and here in person. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been going through the book of Isaiah, and you've probably discovered by now that Isaiah is a pretty long book. <laughs> but we're making some progress. I promise we'll be done by Christmas. Amen. Amen. Last time in our study of Isaiah chapter 56, we talked about some of the wonderful things that Messiah brings into our life when we believe in him to save us from our sins. He gives us some new concerns for righteousness, justice, salvation. He gives us a new community. Jews, Gentiles, everyone part of the family of God who believe in Messiah. And he gives us a new name, an everlasting name. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, that we have been blessed as believers in Jesus, the Messiah, with every blessing in the heavenlies because we're in Christ. But while all these blessings are true, the fact is we still live in a broken world filled with difficulty, suffering, tragedy, and death. An elderly man, a really old man, about 65 years old, when... (laughs) went to his doctor complaining of all the aches and pains all over his body. Doctor gave him a thorough examination and gave him a clean bill of health. And he said, listen, you're in excellent shape for an elderly man of 65. I'm afraid I can't make you any younger. The man man said, I'm not asking you to make me any younger. Just make sure I get older. And that's probably how some of us feel. Uh, The salvation we receive from Jesus by grace, you see, is not an exemption from the world's brokenness in which we live. But even then, the same salvation and blessings promised us in Messiah to save us from our sins also is there to give us the resources we need to face the brokenness in the world and to come through it persevering triumphantly. That's what we're going to talk about today as we pick up our study in Isaiah chapter 57. I'm going to read just parts of it, um, verses 1 and 2, and then I'll jump over to verses 13 to 21, get the idea, and uh, then we'll talk about it for a few minutes today. So if you have your Bible, you want to look along, Isaiah 57, begin in verse 1 and 2, and then jump to verse 13. The righteous man perishes, and no man takes it to heart, and devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from evil, he enters into peace, they rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. Jump to 13. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry all of them up, and breath will take them all away. But he who takes refuge in me shall inherit the land, they shall possess my holy mountain. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on high in a holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, Neither will I always be angry, for the spirit would grow faint within me and the breath of those whom I have made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry and struck him, and I hid my face and was angry. He went on turning away in the way of his heart. I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore him, store and comfort him. Uh, to his mourners, create the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far, and peace to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea. It cannot be quiet. Its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So we dig into this chapter. I'll cover it in three main points kind of simplify things, what in this outline God is asking us to do as his people. First, he asks us to consider an inconvenient truth. Second thing we'll look at is he also urges us to face life's broken realities. And third, in that, cling to our hope 
in a broken world. First, God invites us to consider an inconvenient truth, <clears throat> not global warming. Uh, another thing. Uh, verse 1 describes death as a very inconvenient truth that nobody really wants to face that hard. Some people will go to great lengths to avoid facing the tragedy of the world's brokenness and the inevitability of death. A poet once wrote, my face in the mirror isn't wrinkled and drawn. My house isn't dirty. The cobwebs are gone. My garden looks lovely. So does my lawn. I think I might never put my glasses back on. In this passage, God wants us to put our glasses on and consider the hardest thing we'll ever face, death. The righteous man perishes. No one takes it to heart. Devout men are taken away. No one understands. Let's define some terms before we go on in that verse. The righteous, we've talked about before, refers to people who are right in right relationship with God and right with others and everything else in their life. They believe in God, they walk with God, they follow his word. We also talked last time, one of the ways the righteous keep things right is by considering the vulnerable more than just themselves. That's the righteous. The devout, he talks about next, uh, refer to people who love God and love people. Uh, they are people who exemplify the great commandment that Jesus gave us, love the Lord with all their heart, love people as themselves. Righteous and devout. The words perish and taken away, this is important to understand in this passage, refer to a tragic death. They die suddenly. They die unexpectedly. Too early. What happened? These good people. They seem to die young. The inconvenient truth God wants us to consider here, he invites us to consider, we'll look at it in a minute, is not just death in general, but the sudden, tragic, unexpected death of the righteous and good people, God's people. I just had the experience of losing a very good friend of mine, guy I went to seminary with, he's, he's pastored 30 some years, died of esophageal cancer. I'm, what? <laughs> Wait a second. It's, he's, it's, he's a good, righteous guy doing a great ministry. Anyway, that's the kind of thing he's talking about. Unexpected, sudden, tragic. God is saying that this, the sad truth is while people see godly believers taken away suddenly and unexpectedly, nobody's really taking this to heart. Nobody considers what's going on. Why is God allowing this? Um, nobody sees any relationship to themselves and their connection with God. Nobody, I'm going to use this word a lot because it's reflecting of what he's saying. Nobody ponders what it means, lessons we can learn. And if they do, they most of the time get it wrong, blaming God or not trusting his goodness in it. So this passage hits it directly. We must ponder what this means, the sudden, tragic, unexpected death of the righteous in a way that corresponds to God's reality, not our own. Example, you remember the death, some of you familiar with the New Testament, the death of Lazarus in John 11. Uh, he's the brother of Mary and Martha, and Lazarus' sister sent word to Martha, uh, sent word, Martha sent word to Jesus that he, she said to him, he whom you love is sick, Lord. 
But Jesus deliberately waited until he was dead before he showed up. <laughs> hmm. Now, why would Jesus deliberately allow someone he loves to die, not run over there, rescue him, heal him, get him back? Wow, he must have a good answer. Turns out he did. For the glory of God, he didn't go. He let him die. And so that peop other people would believe in him. As we read just a portion of John eleven forty 40 to 43, Jesus said to Martha, Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I, know, I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around it, I said, so that they may believe you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up and came forth. This is the inconvenient truth. None of us, even the best of us, is exempt from tragedy, sickness, disease, and death. Good Christians will get cancer or a virus and die. Good Christians will have accidents, be victimized, and experience tragedy in this broken world, but over which God is sovereignly in control. So we have to look at these things corresponding to God's reality, not our own. So Isaiah 57 asks, what does this mean? How should we respond in faith and hope? How do we face the realities of still living in a broken world? Should we freak out and panic? Should we get mad at God for not stepping in, changing things? Should we jettison our faith in God? Well, God's like that, which all the above people do, by the way. That's what this passage tries to answer, showing us what we must do to face life's broken realities, and they are realities. I don't know if you've ever, how much tragedy and sadness and sickness and death you've faced, but it's a reality. Please, God, help us understand how to play, keep our trust in you, our hope in you, while all of this is going on until you return. Verse 1 alerts us to the first thing we must do by telling us that no one's doing it. <laughs> the righteous man perishes, and nobody's taking it to heart. They see it, they acknowledge it, but it's not going any further than right here. Devout men are taken away, but no one gets it. <laughs> What's happening? When all these bad things happen to good people, no, he's saying no one gives serious thought to it, no one takes it to heart, no one, another word for this is ponder it. Uh, ponder means to think deeply about something. It means to meditate on something over and over, until you grasp it, understand it, accept it, and at peace with it. Only God can give you that. God is saying no one is really thinking about this, the tragic, sudden, untimely death of people we love. What's going on? What can I learn from this? The first lesson we learn comes out of this if we ponder it long enough is that we, this is extremely important, got to teach ourselves to abandon our linear thinking. This is a pitfall most, of a, most all of us have fallen into. Linear thinking about moral cause and effect says this. If I'm good, bad things shouldn't happen to me. Got to look after me. If I'm bad, well, that's why bad things are happening to me. I'm bad and God's just punishing me. That's linear thinking. That, 
<laughs> Dangerous thinking. Not a good way to ponder this situation. Not a good way to ponder the death of a righteous man. That's not the way things always work in God's universe, you see, according to God's reality. Consider that maybe, in God's eyes, the best punishment for some people is their success. Consider also that maybe, in God's eyes, the only way for some of his people to really be made fit and equipped to serve him is through suffering. Consider the man born blind in the New Testament in John chapter 9. It's linear thinking that asks, as the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned to get this result? Him or their parents? There's the binary choice. Somebody must have sinned here. No. Here's God's higher thinking. There is good that he wants to do that we have not seen yet. God has a good purpose through which in that case was to show his glory again. Every, I'm convinced, every other spiritual, religious, philosophical answer to suffering is flat and unsatisfying. You don't get anywhere, it's empty. Only Christianity, only Jesus, the scripture, bring us any kind of real, rational sense to it. With the reality of the sovereign God in control of life and death, here is his response we need to ponder, consider because he gives it to us. Nobody's taken it to heart, but let me give you this. The righteous man perishes, no one takes it to heart, devout men are taken away while no one understands before. Let me explain it to you. The righteous man is taken away from evil. When I do that, I've got very good reasons to do it. When someone righteous is suddenly cut off, you don't know what God knows. I don't know what he knows. There's per this passage suggests there's some evil he's sparing that person from. Some greater evil. From our point of view, things look untimely, uh, out of whack, doesn't make sense, but we don't have the full picture of God's reality. We need to acknowledge that. We don't see what God sees. We need to stop saying things like, oh, I can't see anything good that God could possibly bring out of that. How could we know? The lesson is this. If you are one of God's people, know first of all that bad things can happen to you. And when they do, it's time to ponder that God's good purpose will be accomplished through it, even if you can't see it. That's the Romans 8.28 reflection. That's what he's saying here. I'm doing something you can't see, but I see it. I'm actually doing good here. <laughs> anyway, when we face life's cruel realities by pondering the comforting reality of God's sovereign power and goodness, who oversees my life and death issues. Um, the passage continues with, to help us cling to this hope in a broken world. As Isaiah 57 unfolds, what I look at as three ways we should be pondering <clears throat> when the righteous suffer, when the unexpected happens, when we're, we're observing something that seems totally beyond us to understand. Three things I pull out of this passage for us to ponder. First, we need to ponder by looking in, in. Here's how you can ponder suffering and come out on the other side a better person rather than a bitter person. Start looking within. When tragedy strikes, strikes we must begin by looking in our own heart because our tendency is to blame others look for a scapegoat, excuse, or judge other people, 
or being mad at God. That's not going to, not a good way to ponder. It'll only make you sick. Fruitless. Look within. Isaiah 57, 3 to 13 directs us, uh, directs our pondering this way. God's confronting the idols of our heart and the false gods we live for when something like this hits. Here's what I mean. In verse 4, God calls his people here children of rebellion, offspring of deceit. What he's doing is exposing their false thinking. (laughs) They don't see it. He's exposing who and what they're really trusting. Not him. The whole discussion of how they were really serving idols, really, it's almost like they were unaware, reaches a climax in verse 13, where he says, he says this. So keep in mind, been hit with trauma, tragedy, unexpected, a good dive, whoa. Uh, When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. When you're in trouble, go ahead and let your idols save you. If you want to see what your idols are, then look no further than how you respond to suffering something that makes you upset or mad or pointing at others. Look at that, because that's how you'll see them. Jeremiah 2, 28, he says the same thing to Jeremiah's people, but he says, but where are your gods which you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble. For according to the number of your cities are your gods Oh, Judah. When we look in, first place we need to look is, man, what's coming out right now? And what does that mean? I'm pondering. What, What does that mean? What kind of person am I? What am I really trusting in? Only... Only the true God can be with you as you go through suffering, adversity, and bring you out on the other side. Only him. All the other gods, this is interesting, you see this in the scripture, all the other gods will abandon you in the storm, in traumas, tragedies, and the viruses of life. Consider Uh, What can be with us when we face the greatest challenges of our life? I don't know about you, but when I went into surgery, uh, you know, spent a whole lot of time getting me ready. They prepped me, wheeled me in, my family's hanging around, we're prayer, and uh, then they're getting ready to wheel me in the operating room. Well, wait a second, family, you can't come in. He has to go in alone, see You stay out here. The people and things I loved the most couldn't go with me. But I'll tell you what, the Lord went with me and gave me his peace. He can go with me no matter what I'm facing. Or consider grief, which we'll all face and experience. When you look into the coffin of your loved one, can your career be with you at that moment? Can your hobbies or your other interests in life? No. No. Worse, what if you made an idol of the person in the coffin? Can they help you? No. They cannot help you. Only the Lord can be with you in loss. Or consider failure. When you've really blown it, when others are disappointed in you, and you're even condemning yourself, feeling terrible, I'll tell you something, 
False gods can't forgive you or cause good to come from your mistakes. They can't. But I'll tell you what they can do. They can keep punishing you for your sins. That's what false gods do. To keep you in bondage under their thumb and chains. Only the Lord himself can offer true freedom from the guilt of sin and work everything out for good according to his purpose. Only he can do that. No false god can do it. No idol can do that. So the first thing we need to do when we look in, is there any idol that's just surfing me, my heart from full devotion to the Lord my God? That's what he challenges them. Hey, let your idols serve you, right? save you. Do you see him? Do you see him there while you're thinking and pondering this tragic situation? Do you see it? What's coming out right now? That's how you know. The real God is the only God you cannot lose who can always be with you no matter what. You will lose loved ones. You'll lose your job. You'll lose your money. You'll lose your looks, sorry to say. You will even lose your health. What are you really relying on? No false God can help you when your heart is breaking. They will all abandon you. What have you placed your trust in? Now I think in a similar way, echoing Isaiah, Jesus <clears throat> told his disciples <laughs> to do this kind of pondering when they're thinking about tragedy. I'm telling you, this is, this is real stuff right here. Here's Jesus, <clears throat> Luke 13, <clears throat> 1 to 5. Now, on the, on the same occasion, <clears throat> There were some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Whoa. What a tragic, unjust, oppressive. Now, what's coming out of my heart? Where am I looking first? Jesus said to them, uh, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you, let's go look at you now. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 who were on the Tower of Siloam the, this great tragic accident fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? Again, linear thinking. I tell you, no. Hey, how about look in? You see? You, you analyze, here's what's wrong with that situation. I know it's because of you and you and you, and we, I wouldn't be like this if it weren't for you. Wait a second, this awful adversity, here's where I need to start. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So the first help he gives us is look in. Second, when you ponder tragedy, look down. Humble yourself before God. Isaiah 57, 15. <clears throat> As they're pondering their heart, he goes right into this. He confronts the idols in their heart, saying, do you see, are they saving you? He goes right into this. For thus says the high and lofty one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and lofty place. In other words, he can see so much more than we can. But I also dwell with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the 
in order to revive them, give them life. First, the Hebrew word, I'm just going to say this now and it'll make sense in a minute. First, the Hebrew word for contrite is the word, is actually the word crushed. And God is saying, when our problems end up crushing us, that's, if, if we humble ourselves, that's when we'll experience God's real presence with us in the greater sense. Uh, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Hebrew word lowly is used to describe this kind of person, uh, someone who doesn't promote themselves, who's all about them, pride, arrogance, people who push to the front of the line, who insist on their own way. What's interesting is you really, it's odd that you see crushed and lowly together. They're not often seen together, crushed and lowly. But it is here. I think the intention is probably because when we get crushed in life, what's happening is we, we've, we've just lost control. Uh, something, and our response is usually not to get lowly, it's to get angry, defensive, centered more on us rather than the Lord or others. You, here's what the, this passage is, is suggesting, that when we're pondering adversity, we can actually become a crushed, lowly person. Broken, broken, not bitter. And read the New Testament, Jesus is magnetically drawn to people like that. So first, when you ponder tragedy, look within. But for the grace of God, go I. I am a sinner, saved by grace. Second, when you ponder tragedy, look down. <laughs> Humble yourself before God. He's the high and lofty one, not me. I'm not God. I don't have all this figured out. I do not have to have it my way. He sees much more than I do. Third, when you ponder tragedy, finally look up. Look to our hope in the Lord. Isaiah 57, 1 to 2, I'm coming back to that. God says that if you're one of God's people, even if death strikes you unexpectedly or one you love, it is because First of all, God is sparing you or a loved one from some evil you or they will face. That's our confidence. There's a good, good, good reason coming from God's lofty position himself. The righteous man perishes and no one takes it to heart. The devout men are taken away and no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from evil the righteous man is taken away from evil. He enters into peace. They rest in their bed, each one who walked in his upright way. So first, God is sparing the person from evil. Second, God says that in death he will welcome you with open arms, and you will enter God's peace and rest. If you're in right relationship with God and something terrible happens to you, there's a good reason, even though you can't see it. It's always either to protect you from something worse or bring glory to God, some other divine purpose. And oftentimes we can't see it. We have to trust that he knows and he's good. But at the end of this chapter, there's a very solemn warning. It's given to those who are not in right relationship with God. They will not enter God's peace and rest. 57, 20, 21, but the wicked are like the tossing sea. It cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So how does a person make sure they're in right relationship with God? Well, God gives us the answer, obviously, in the New Testament to receive God's gift of salvation, of eternal life. Scriptures proclaim we must believe in God's Son, Jesus the Messiah, who was sent by God to die in our place for our sins so that we would receive his righteousness and live. All who believe in Jesus are declared righteous in God's sight. 
It's not our righteousness. It's Jesus' righteousness. Isaiah, you see, in this chapter is pointing us to Jesus. As I mentioned before, the word contrite in Isaiah 57, 15 is the same word crushed used in Isaiah 53, 5 for the Messiah who is crushed for our iniquities. It's an it's a intentional connection. Jesus has been given the power to give us life when we believe in him because he was the one who took our crushing for us. So in Isaiah 57, God is saying, in a broken world, it's possible bad things may happen to you. Your idols will not be able to help you. They will abandon you. I am the only one. You can trust to save you, be with you no matter what, and bring good out of your situation for my glory. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that truth. And if you are righteous through faith in Messiah, and the worst thing happens to you, your death, you, God says, you will be at peace finally with me. That's good news. That's, that's the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your mercy and grace toward us in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, well, we confess that we do not have the knowledge you have, the infinite knowledge you have. Uh, we do not know uh, sometimes what really is going on, and you want us to take the time to be with you, to talk to you, and to let you guide us through, uh, starting with what really is going on in our own hearts. Show us that, Lord, and as, as the psalmist David prayed, uh, that you would show him uh, all that's in his heart so that he might serve you with a whole and full heart. We pray that same prayer for us. We ask you to bless us now as we continue to worship you in all we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.